<laughs> no problem. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm told the cookies will be here soon. Um, so this is the June edition of our monthly adaptation community meeting. I'm standing near Peter so the people online can hear us. His microphone is wired for the online thing. People on the webinar, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Comonix for hosting and the Atlas Project for hosting us here. Um, Peter Cocopelli is with Climate Decision, and he's going to talk about uh, an early warning system for typhoons in China. Um, before we get started, I'll just lay out a little bit of what we do here. Um, we've been having these meetings for, I think, four years. Um, if you're working on something to do with adaptation and you're in the Washington area, whether you're based here or you're passing through, let us know. We'd love to hear about what your work is. The idea is to encourage collaboration, sharing of ideas, um, and getting to know each other um, so that from the aid perspective, as the contracts and grants come and go, we like to see teams form and reform and the best people align. So it's great for people to get to know each other. Um, but mostly we just want to learn what's going on, learn from each other. Um, in July, our speaker will be Karen Fox with Pango. Pango is working with the Atlas Project, who are our hosts here. Um, and Pango has been looking at uh, uh, adaptive agriculture strategies in Ethiopia um, and trying to evaluate them for their effectiveness and their um, scalability to other countries. It's tied to the Feed, Feed the Future work in Ethiopia. So it's all under the USAID umbrella, um, but climate programs are looking at work that's been going on with Feed the Future. So we're trying to bring those two big initiatives together. Um, August, we will not meet because it will be summertime still. And uh, we don't tend to get much of a crowd in August. In September, the speakers will be from the US Global Change Research Program, the interagency um, coordinating body for US government uh, research on climate change. Um, the topic will be the fourth national climate assessment, which is just in the planning stages now and is due in, I think, in 2018. Um, and we'll either be here at Comonix or trying to see if we can uh, go to the Wilson Center. Um, Roger Mark, if you're listening, we need some info. Um, so we'll, we'll let you know later in the summer and well before September um, whether we'll be here or at the Wilson Center. Um, regardless, uh, these are almost always on the third Thursday of the month. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Peter. Thank you, John. And I'm going to, while I introduce my a little bit more about climate decision, I'm going to walk to the back of the room and pick up the clicker, which I think is sitting right there. So uh, climate decision is a startup company. Uh, we're located in Bethesda, Maryland. And we help organizations and businesses with the uh, weather risk and the, the problems posed by climate change. And one of those that we're going to talk about specifically today is that of the tropical storms. So we have a project that we've been working on for the last year in Guangxi Province, China, to develop a typhoon early warning system. Uh, we have a small group. I was going to encourage people to pose questions as we, we go through it. Uh, there will be an audience participation part of the presentation as well later. So <laughs> keep with me. <clears throat> So uh, Guangxi is in a very southernmost part of uh, China. It shares a, a border with Vietnam. Uh, it actually has a short coastline. It's only about 125 miles is the crow flies. It's, that's on the, the uh, Gulf of Tonkin facing into the South China Sea. But what's amazing is they still get hit by five tropical storms a year, just that, that one little part of, the, of China. Uh, it's just a, a bowling alley in that part of the world for, for typhoons. Uh, for comparison, the entire US coast, that is the entire Atlantic coast, wrapping all the way around Florida and in the Gulf Coast, typically gets hit with one to two landfalling hurricanes. And I think that's the forecast for this year, the consensus is going to be a normal year. So China has been hit by four record typhoons in a row. Vicente in 2012, Haiyan in 2013, 
Super Typhoon Ramasin in 2014, and Mujigai in 2015. Uh, Mujigai happened just as we were happened to be flying out of China in our initial meeting on this this trip, and it was I'm going to actually focus on that that storm today because it had some very interesting aspects. So I think, as everybody knows, the east coast of China is where much of the development is happening. Incredible industrialization, uh, population movement to the east, and much of that that density of population is close to the coastline. That's where these huge cities are. Um, Guangzhou is right next to Guangxi. I think it's in the, easily in the 15 million people range, that city. So we have our uh, first animation here. There's three animations. I apologize to the people who are online. Uh, they won't be able to see it. I will describe it. <laughs> uh, this is an animation paired by uh, NOAA uh, to show what happens in storm surge. And that's really the, the topic we're talking about. There's there's three hazards posed by tropical storms. Wind, which I think everybody is familiar with, and uh, is you know blowing the shingles off your house and, and so on, and, and wave, which is an, an interesting phenomenon because that happens both out at sea, it's a marine hazard, and also on shore. But storm surge is, is that force of water. It's that, that level of water above your normal tide, and it's got the force of the ocean behind it as it's driving on shore. Uh, storm surge is, is also a real concern in terms of if you're looking at flooding because it's salt water. And if you consider, for example, Hurricane Sandy, uh, incredible damage to the, uh, uh, the, the electrical system and the subways because these components were getting exposed to salt water where they never expected it. So today we're going to be talking about storm surge. Storm surge is responsible for fatalities and, and property damage every year. Um, this chart here shows some of the major events uh, since 1900. In 1970, in Bangladesh, a typhoon killed 350,000 people. More recently, in Myanmar, uh, uh, Typhoon Nargis in, in uh, 2008 killed somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 to 150,000 people. These storms are, are enormous potential for damage. In China, the coastal flooding from these two most recent storms, from Ramasin and Mujigai, um, both there were fatalities uh, in the uh, around 20 people in each storm, and very widespread property damage, uh, including in some cases far inland to agricultural areas. Um, <clears throat> actually, this is a nice time just to talk about. If you notice, there's three storms in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is perhaps the most vulnerable country in the world, and I'll. I'll take this moment to point out that USAID has done some very good work there, um, putting in a, a, a flood warning system that actually uh, it was very effective. That one of the last pieces, of course, when you're getting these systems in is trying to figure out how you do the communication part. And apparently it worked very well. They moved a very large number of people out of the way. I don't even know the name of the storm. I just saw right up that the evacuation was very successful. The fatalities were very low. And I believe that's a system where they've been working with uh, NASA on that, the yes. severe. severe. Yeah, under severe. So that was really a, a success story there. And unfortunately, of course, the success stories don't end up in the news. They end up in a little you know, one column inch in some blog I was reading. But it was tremendous. I mean, it, these are the kind of things that, you know, as you can see, routinely were kill, killing a lot of people. So now we're going to talk about why, why do you model storm surge? And the reason is it's, it's this very tricky phenomenon. On the one hand, the, the hurricane forecasts have gotten better and better every year. And if you look at, for example, on the Atlantic coast, the National Hurricane Center in 1985, their three-day forecast would have an error of about 350 miles, a pretty big distance. And by uh, last year, that was down to 80 miles. And that's, if you think of those, when they, they were getting to that time of year, and you, you on the evening news, they'll be showing that the track, and they'll have that cone uncertainty around it, that's what's shrinking every year. They're getting it down smaller and smaller. So the track forecasts are really getting really good. The problem with storm surge is it's very sensitive to changes in the position of the storm, the angle that it's approaching, sto the, the, the approaching the shoreline. Uh, it's sensitive to changes in, in the, the pressure of the storm. 
the radius of maximum winds, the velocity, the intensity of the storm, and also to the characteristics of the, 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 the land, of, of bays and, and estuaries. Um, so this is an example close to home. So we've got Washington, D.C. there at the top. This is the uh, mouth of the Chesapeake Bay right here. And the pink track is uh, Hurricane Isabel. And the reason we did this simulation is we met with uh, the emergency preparedness folks for Washington, D.C. And they'd mentioned that they'd been there in the, during Hurricane Sandy. And if you recall, that was coming up the coast. And it was threatening to turn left take that at different points. Well, at one point, they thought it was going to come in over the Outer Banks and head towards DC. And they told us they got a warning at that point that it, there would be uh, water levels of, levels of 15 feet at the DC waterfront. That's very high. 15 feet is very high and enough to really get your attention. And we hadn't heard that before. So we're going, well, that's kind of interesting. Let's, let's, let's do a little model here. So we, we ran about 200 tracks through a, a, a slosh model, a, a NOAA model. And, and we placed Hurricane Sandy on these tracks. And actually, the, the Hurricane Isabel track is a good example of what happened with this, uh, these scenarios. So that, that's the, the pink line you see there. And the red, the pink dashed line here, that's the radius of the Hurricane Isabel storm. And that arrow, that's your wind direction. That's the circular rotation of the storm. And that's what's driving your storm surge. So your most powerful storm surge is going to be on this side of the storm. So now you can start seeing why the position of the track is so sensitive. If the edge of your storm, where your maximum winds, is close to the mouth of the Chesapeake, it's going to drive water up the Chesapeake. And even more so is that storm moves, and it's parallel and driving water into the Potomac, which is right there. That's also going to have, here it's, it's not that big an opening, but that's the effects the modeling is picking up. And it turns out that uh, in this scenario, putting Hurricane Sandy on the Isabel track, you end up with water levels in the 17 to 18 foot uh, at, at Washington, D.C. waterfront. That's above the level of, of the levees that protect downtown. So at that point, well, where we are right now, actually, would be underwater. Not, well, yeah, maybe even this room. So <laughs> we're pretty low down. Um, so that is, that's, that can show you that, that, that all these different things that these storm surge models are taking into account. Um, the other interesting thing with this, of course, too, is that Hurricane Isabel was a Category 3 storm. Sandy, by this time, had been downgraded to a tropical storm. So even though it was not that powerful a storm, just because of its diameter, it was so big, it had a big effect on storm surge. So a storm surge model can be used for several different things. Uh, it can be used for risk assessment, where you run scenarios like I was showing you there to look at what would be the effect of historical storms on a, on a particular location or even a particular facility. You can also do it catastrophe modeling. And that's where you run tens of thousands or even 100,000 storms through a model. And then that gives you a whole range of probabilities. And that's where you get your 100-year your event or your 500-year event from. And that would tell you those water levels and what the water level would be at a given location for, let's say, a 100-year event. The other purpose is for forecasting. And that's where you get a, a forecast track and you put it in the model to find out what the water levels are forecast to be. And uh, you can also use it for damage assessment. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into that now. We can come back to that later. Um, the stakeholders on this system were Sun Yat-sen University, which is actually in Guangzhou, uh, the Guangxi Province Weather Bureau, which is located in Nanning, China, and Climate Decision. The system owner and operator is the Weather Bureau. And they're currently using it for risk assessment. So this is the first season as they go into where it's operational. So how do you run a storm surge model? And this is, this is the part of this which is, it, it just amazes me. And I feel like, in a way, we, we take it for granted. Because the technology is it's really incredible that you, you take a track file. And a track file is literally just a text file. It's a very simple thing. You can get it from 
uh, authorities. You can get it from companies like uh, Kenanko, which is located in DC, which provides real-time weather information. You input that into the model. You run it for two hours. And it outputs your water levels at a given location and will tell you what the, how those water levels will change over each hour of the forecast. And to me, it's, 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 it's almost like sorcery. It's just so amazing. This is not running on a supercomputer. This is running on a commodity Linux PC. You can run this on a $1,000 machine, and it will tell you in two hours what the impact of a storm will be on, on, on your water levels. And you, know, you just think of, of, of all of the, what went into making that happen. I, it's just, I, I think it's really neat. Oh, and just to. Uh, Looking at this graphic here, so uh, again, the pink line here is the storm track with the um, dates there. Um, the water levels are a little hard to make out, but the peak water levels, uh, as it comes on shore there, and this is actually in Guangdong, this is Mujigai again, um, are up in the five to six meter range, so 15 to 19 feet. That's, that's uh, really is quite a serious storm. So one of the things we want to talk about today were the challenges of putting this together. And the first thing you face is you need data. Um, there's three key data sets you need. Uh, the bathymetry, which is the shape of the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the, your digital elevation model, or your topography of the land the, above the water level. A coastline, defining the, where those two meet. And then you also need water level uh, data from tide gauges so you can calibrate and validate the model. Uh, in China, and, and actually probably in a, a, quite a number of other countries as well, this data is, is considered sensitive. Uh, it's not publicly available. So we had to come up with a different approach. And what we went to was using global open data sets. Uh, so for the bathymetry, we used GEBCO, which was developed in the United Kingdom. It's a, a, a one kilometer global bathymetry. Uh, for the digital elevation, we use the US uh, shuttle radar uh, topography. And then we use US coastline data from the National Geospatial Agency. Now, the trick on using these data sets is uh, this data is sometimes dirty. Uh, the shuttle data has voids in it. Um, it may not fit very well with the other data. So there was a fair amount of manual work at cleaning it up and putting it together. Uh, Another thing is, is that it may not have very good detail inside estuaries. And estuaries are often where your population is concentrated. So in some cases, we went to the university. As I mentioned, Sun Yat-sen University was a partner on this. And they pulled up research papers that we were able to supplement actually manually, take the bathymetry out of a research paper for an important estuary, and build that into the model. Even though you had working closely with Chinese partners, to go to global data sets. They could yes. Yeah, it, there is a great deal of sensitivity around all these data sets at this time. Uh, and we're, oh, let me repeat the question. Sorry. So, so the question was, you know, if we have, a, if our, our client was the government itself, uh, why were we having to go to these, you know, work with open data or in this case go to research papers to find it? And the reason is, is actually, it's, it'd be quite familiar to, if, even if you think in the US, uh, data sets have different owners who have different objectives for that data. Uh, and in this case, I wouldn't be surprised that all three of those key data sets, or all four of them, might be owned by different, different agencies. Um, and in particular, the bathymetry, I think the South China Sea is perhaps the most contested area of uh, ocean uh, in the world right now. So there is a great deal of sensitivity about military operations in that area. Um, the, we, we've been continuing to have discussions. We actually are, are optimistic that over time, some more data will become available. Uh, as an interesting example, we, in uh, Nanning, which is where we were working, it's a, a good-sized city, about 3 million people, uh, we met with a uh, hydrologist who purchased rainfall data from an agency. And that's not ideal. You know, you'd like to be able to just go and download it off the web. But it's an option. If you're needing to build a flood model, purchasing rainfall data is a reasonable way to go, as long as the price isn't 
too extreme. And we have another question. Do you find data for the most part to be accurate and reliable? Yeah, so the question was on the accuracy of the data. Um, no, there are the, the, uh, the bathymetry, both the bathymetry and the, uh, the shuttle radar topography leave something to be desired. As I mentioned, there's voids in it. Yeah. Um, and there were, there were definitely values that were just out of range. So it was really up to a, a very skilled modeler who was very good at, at working with this. You can use statistical approaches to deal with that. But as I said, in some cases, it was manual work, like literally taking research paper and manually taking the data out of that and fitting it together. Um, so in effect, you know, there's a trade-off there. You're getting the data for free, but it's not really free because you're putting a lot of labor into making it work right. And skill. I mean, you couldn't have done this. It took somebody with a lot of experience to make it work. So the other challenge is that the uh, a storm surge model has to be accurate because you want people's lives depend on this. You really want to make sure that the water levels it's putting out are right. But it also has to be fast. And those two things work in opposition to each other. So this is our model grid. That, that's this graphic we've been showing. And uh, it's a triangular grid. And the, the number of nodes in that grid is the biggest driver of processing time. And unfortunately, as you add more nodes, the processing goes up geometrically. It's not just a nice straight line. So what we did is we used a very coarse mesh at the, at the edge of the, at this ocean boundary. It's about 50 kilometers. Because once you're that far offshore, the impact of, of, of the information here on what happens in a coastal area, which is what our clients were concerned with, is very small. And then as you can tell from the graphic, as it gets closer and closer to shore, the mesh gets finer and finer. And by the time you're on the Guangxi coastline, right in here, it's uh, 300 meter resolution, so one third kilometer. And at one third kilometer, there you're getting actual information as you reach even up into bays, which you can even see in here. It's a complex coastline with bays and estuaries all along it. Uh, and that's really important, because that's where the cities are. So we. We designed the grid. It's also a relatively small grid. If you look at the kind of modeling people are doing in the US, they have these massive grids that go from um, you know, Maine all the way down to Virginia. And they run on gigantic supercomputers with thousands of processors. And that's not what our client could do. There's very few clients who have access to those kind of machines. And even then, on a supercomputer, it may take too long to run. You want something. It'll run, as we said, in a couple hours. That was our goal, and that's what we achieved. And so it's, it, we're, we're making trade-offs here to get a model which gets good, accurate results, but in a fast run time. And running, as I said, on a, on a commodity workstation, not on any kind of special machine. OK, so now I've got a challenge for you all. <clears throat> we are looking at. Typhoon Mujigai coming in. It's October 2nd. Uh, we have two tracks here. These were uh, provided by Kananco, Kinetic Analysis. This uh, pink colored one is October 1st. This is the Philippines down there, as you see. And the green one is October 2nd. And it's got the past positions in black, the current position in green, and then the future positions. These are six hours apart as it's, as it's heading to landfall in China. So we have um, three decision makers here who are, have to decide what to do with their operations. We have a manager of a shipping company, a power grid operations chief, and a university facilities operations director. So what I need is I need three people, and it could be teams of people, to volunteer. And I've even got, to make it official, I've got placards. for uh, <laughs> So you get a title with this as well as the responsibility. OK, we got one in the back. You, you get first choice, then. Shipping. Shipping. Excellent choice. OK, there we go. One more. OK, excellent. OK. <laughs> 
Um, and I will say there, there are, this is, a, this is actually a, a very tricky problem in the sense that if there were easy right answers, then everybody would know what to do in these storms, and you'd never have things like Katrina or Sandy. So um, it's actually very, very difficult, the decision making in these cases. And then we'll walk through it step by step. So the, oops, I went the wrong way. OK, so the first, we have a shipping company manager. Let's see, that's uh, in, the, in the back there. And you're located in Beihai, the port of Beihai right here. And you're running operations, marine operations, between Beihai and Hong Kong. So your decision is whether to suspend your operations in the face of this typhoon. Now, you run seven days a week. You don't take Sundays off. You've got, you know, your boss is looking at this. You know, it's going to cost the money a lot of, company a lot of money to, to slow things down. So looking at what you see right here, right now, what, what, would, be your, what would be your thoughts? I'm just going to repeat. Um, in the map, there is a <coughs> narrow channel uh, that the, the standard shipping route would go through. It's quicker to get to uh, Hong Kong. And I guess the thought is, um, if you try and go through there on your normal route and you get hit in the uh, storm surge, and, and you could lose your entire operation, or you could consider maybe a different route mm -hmm. um, that puts you at less risk. But it would depend mm -hmm. on when the storm surge hits and the traffic goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, timing is critical. The storm, the we have a. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's correct. That normally, because that rotation of the storm. The right side would be where you'd expect the, the storm surge to be greatest. Any other comments on that? Yeah, we got, we'll get the mic over there. Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to keep that example. Of course. I'm just curious, uh, what was the forecast for the storm surge on the high side, on the left side? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We're actually, so right now, we're operating in a, uh, a uh, low information mode. <laughs> Um, it, it's sort of, if you're imagining, you're, you're operating now before you get the storm surge model. And I'll show you the results after we have the discussion. Um, this actually is not that far from the truth. The reason, getting back to a, uh, the earlier question here, you might ask, why were we hired by a weather bureau to build a storm surge model? The reason is that they had very hard time getting detailed information from the central authorities. A very familiar problem to anybody working in a big country that that it you know you, at a local level you may have a hard time getting access to the information you need. They were getting a very general type of information about water levels. Um, U.S. is not that far ahead on that. Just this year, the National Hurricane Center for the first time is putting out operational storm surge inundation maps. That's the first time they've done it this year. It's been experimental, I think, for three years. And um, it's, it's, it's difficult. This stuff just is not easy. And, and you can see if the National Hurricane Center, it took them years to get to the point where they really felt confident about putting this information out to the public. And there was a lot. I was actually at an entire meeting, AMS meeting, several years ago, where all they talked about was what colors to make the different zones. <laughs> and you know, there's just so much thought that has to go into like, how do you make sure people understand the warning and respond appropriately, and don't mix up the colors and go the wrong way or or whatever. There's really, it's it's just not it's not easy. So so that's what we're doing right now. We're thinking it through, but in a uh, low information environment right now. <laughs> Any comments on the shipping? Okay, we'll move ahead to our next challenge. So this is the, the Guangxi power grid. And in this case, we've got uh, four cities we're looking at. And please forgive my pronunciation, but uh, Qinzhou, Qishonggong, Zhangjiang, and Yangjiang here. Now, Zhangjiang is close to, the at this point, the forecast landfall area. And so in this case, the power grid manager has to decide where to pre-position supplies is to help with the restoration efforts. And I think for 
people around here, they're well, of course, familiar with PEPCO. Uh, they may or may not do this, but they, um, it's, it's very helpful if you have your trucks and equipment actually on site at the, where the damage occurs because often roads are blocked. So in this case, our power grid manager, who, which is uh, right there, um, you can choose which two cities you want to preposition your equipment in. Okay, so just to be clear, um, this is I'm making these decisions without access to much information. That's right. This is what you've got right now. You've got the all I know is, is the, 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 the tracks. Track. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, now that, you, now that we focus so much on the the counterclockwise rotation and the storm surge being more on the right side of the storm track. Uh, I might make a different decision, but I didn't know that. I might just look at the storm track and say, well, it looks like it's going to drive a line right through the, those three cities. So mm -hmm. I'm going to reposition basically in that line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the decision I would make mm -hmm. in my information scarce situation. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I probably uh, the the one up to the far right, Yang 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 Chang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, it looks like they're probably going to get slammed some storm surge. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had more information, I might deploy more resources. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. you know, all other things equal, just just looking at the storm track looks, you know, like it might be relatively okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind is I, I talked about how the track forecasts have gotten much more accurate, but you know, still tracks can be off easily by 100 miles. You know, there can be quite a bit of movement of you know, just even in the last day. So that's always a adds a lot of uncertainty. This planning. Any other comments on the power grid? John's got. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, yeah. We're we're um, we're kind of crossing jurisdictional borders here, but yeah, that is correct. Yeah. So here's the line between Guangxi and, and Guangdong, right there. It is interesting, though, that often um, the uh, both provinces are are hit by the same storm. That's actually not unusual at all. Okay, our third challenge was the Guangdong Ocean University. It's located in Shenzhen, right here. Uh, they have a campus with 20,000 students. And your choice is going to be to evacuate the students or shelter in place and pick a couple of these five facilities where, that you're going to defend to try and, and, uh, and, and hold the ground there. Thank you. <laughs> now you gotta you do have two days, so <clears throat> landfall's projected for October fourth. I mean it might depend in part on if those are just big enough in the university to actually allow people to be on high. Mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Hopefully I would have that information. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it's an either or evacuation, saving marine life, I guess I would go with evacuation. But that would be a hard call in terms of values and buildings for the future operations of the university. Yeah, high, high ground can be an interesting place to be in a, in a tropical storm. I was, when we first went to um, Nanning, uh, that would be in March of. Last year, I was uh, fly. I was on a flight that was continuing on to Hainan, the island island here, and I sat next to somebody uh, who had lived there, and I asked, "Wow, what was it like to be in a couple of these storms?" Now, at that point, it would have been Vicente and High End. She says, "Well, I live in a high rise, so the windows went immediately." Um, but she said, "Even if you had the shutters up." The rain was so strong that it would 
drive water right through. So it was almost like a flood anyway. And so the whole time they're sitting there mopping up the water. I mean, it's, it's really challenging dealing with these storms of this intensity. I mean, the question is, can they get 20,000 people to anywhere in the state or Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My question is, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, I guess, the idea in 2005. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is. It's it's really hard. It, and what do you do? Where do you put? That's right. Where do you put them? Where they're safe? You know what? You know who has place for twenty thousand people just sitting around where? Okay, so now we'll we'll look at how things uh, it happens. So the first one we're going to look at is the marine operations, and we'll have another animation to run here. And so what we'll, we're seeing here for the people who are in the webinar is a uh, it's a storm surge model, but with a wave model running on top of it, and the scale here goes up to twelve meters. So that red area was waves significant wave height twelve meters high, so that's approaching 40 feet high. And you know, it crossed right across the shipping channel. So that would be, I, I'm not much of a boater, I canoe, but I would think that a 40 foot wave would be enough challenge for almost any ship out there. And so I think your concept of maybe going around the storm the other way would be a, would have worked pretty well. Another interesting thing with the wave model that's worth pointing out, if you notice, the highest intensity was offshore, and it dissipated very quickly as it went onto shore. The effect of waves in terms of raising the storm surge was very small in this storm. It was only about half a meter. So if you're the, the total, we'll see, see on the next slide, this total storm surge was in the uh, area of five meters. The wave on shore only added about half a meter. So in this case, the wave is the really significant effect of the wave is for marine operations. But if you're running shipping or ferries or fishing boats, there's fishing boats that come out of that port of Beihai. It really would have been a, a bad situation. And there were boaters lost in that storm. So we have another uh, view here. Uh, this is the storm surge model. Running. And uh, the, uh, the arrows are the wind vectors, which really gives you that feeling for the rotation of the storm. And as it comes into shore, you'll see that the, the highest storm surge is to the right, but not very far to the right, not all the way over. I think it was an interesting point you know, with Young Jong, which is over here. It was to the right, but this was actually a, a fairly small diameter storm. I, I'll have a different view of that later. Um, so it, it, didn't, it, it ended up being pretty compact. There was no assurance of that. Storms sometimes get really big, but in this case, that's the way it turned out. And we have a question here. These are great data, and it looks like a hell of a storm. And I'm wondering, is the data empirically flat? Like, are there wave you know, buoys and wind meters? How did you get the data, or is it? This is all generated by the model. So it, it model. this is that's the thing. It's right. it's so amazing about the model. You put that text track file into it, and the model has it built into it everything else it needs to generate the water levels and the significant wave height. We can assume that that's pretty. There is, um, yeah, the, there, there are ways to, uh, to, to validate the wave height. We're actually just in development right now, so we haven't gotten to that point on this. Um, uh, for the storm surge, the way you validate it is against water tide gauges on shore. Uh, and and it's, going back to a previous uh, discussion in terms of data availability, one thing China has done recently is they've added uh, five or six new tide gauges to the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, system. So starting, unfortunately, it was some of them only really started in mid-2015. We have very good hourly data coming out of these gauges. Now, the one thing that happens on these gauges, though, and this is everywhere around the world, is when you have a big storm, they get wiped out. So what happened with Mujigai? The, the key gauge we needed was wiped out. It was not operational for about, well, from like a day before to two days after landfall. So that's one of the challenges of this kind of work. 
Um, and there's some really interesting approaches that they take. Like after Katrina, Noah sends a, sent a team and a people, and they literally go out in the harbor, they climb up wooden pilings, and they look at where stuff was driven into the piling, the highest level where that occurred. That's how they determined that the storm surge for Katrina was 27 feet. Just enormous storm surge. That, I think, is the record in the US. So there's a lot of sort of almost forensics that has to go on after a storm to determine maximum water levels. Um, the other way it's done today, it, social media, I think, could eventually be a really key in that. There's so many photographs now that um, you can go around and just look at. If it's got a timestamp on it, that can really help you determine how high water levels were. Any other questions? So that's, this one here, just to repeat, that was actually the storm surge model running itself. And the, the peak water levels were up and around uh, something over uh, 4 meters, so around 12 or 13 feet. So now we have this question of where to uh, pre-position the power supplies and, uh, or, and, and the evacuate or, or defend the campus. So this is the maximum storm tide uh, at, it, that is the maximum value at any point during the storm. So this wasn't all simultaneous. This was the maximum value at any point over that period of the storm. So you, you see our four locations. And um, I think the first question, the power supply, I think you'd, you'd post putting it up in, in uh, you consider putting in Yongzheng. But yeah. then. The, well, yeah, I wasn't trying to be consistent with the, the game where mm -hmm. I had limited information and I just, it was not storm track. And I, Given, given just having limited information and just sort of having the general storm track, I, I probably would have prepositioned basically in a straight line mm -hmm. along you know, the, the cities that seem to be right, right path. But then I was sort of speculating as to whether storm, the actual greatest um, damage from the storm surge might actually have been up to the right in the city, the mo most parts to the east. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like what you're saying is it was such a tight, concentrated storm that that that, tended, that wasn't the case. In the yeah. So with this information, you would have known that you could have, if you wanted to, that would have been a great option to to play stuff in Yongzheng. How about our campus? <laughs> what do you have? Seeing this, what do you think you you would do? You get out of there, yeah, yeah. It, it may not it, immediate. You still have that problem of where to put people, but you you at least know where not to put them. Yeah. So um, there were. Um, uh, we'll look at the the tracks now. So this is all four tracks. Uh, the um, the pink and the green we'd seen already. October first and second. October third is the blue one, and October fourth uh, was the uh, track right about made right about at landfall. Um, so there's your current position of the storm right there, and the forecast positions. You know, what's interesting about this, you can just see how tight those tracks are. It was really very, very good forecast. Um, it just it stayed very cohesive all the way through. So the, in this particular case, it really wasn't a, a big concern, the, the accuracy of the, the tracks. It made landfall within about 30 miles of the 48-hour forecast. So in that sense, if you were doing the emergency planning, you'd be, you would have been in pretty good shape based on that. These are some news clips out of uh, Chinese media of some of the effects of the storm. They describe Shenzhen City as being right in the, the center of the typhoon, uh, several million people uh, being affected. Uh, at this point, there were 18 people lost their lives. Four people are missing. Uh, the power grid ended up sending workers to Shenzhen. So actually, you <laughs> you were on the right track there, um, and uh, so that that was where they chose to preposition. They basically put it right right in the path of the storm, which was interesting. Uh, the Guangdong Ocean University, uh, it was uh, not quite a direct hit. But they did note that the glass doors of the Marine Life Museum were blown out. So that would have been a tough place to defend if you'd, if you'd chosen that one. Uh, 
this is showing the best track data. And this is actually something that's put together after the storm as a kind of consensus uh, product. So the dots in the center of the storm show the intensity. This is using the Chinese scale from 1 to 5, where the, the very light color is uh, tropical depression, and then the, the dark red color is a is what they call a super typhoon. And the gray circle is the radius of maximum winds. So you can see there's a lot of dynamic in their storm. And I don't know if anybody would be interested in, in you know, talking about what they see happening to the storm, particularly in the last hours before landfall. So you made a little bit of a turn there. A little bit of a turn. Yeah. yeah. It got people's attention for a second. Mm -hmm. It got out of the track that it was, seemed to be going, but then it seems like it sort of slipped back in. It's just sort of an anomaly. Yep. How about the intensity? Yeah, it's, it's, right, the, the gray circle around is the wave. It's the radius of maximum winds. So it became more dense. Yes, yeah, it actually, it, it's, it hit the Philippines, which is down the lower right corner. It was a much bigger storm and, it, and much more concentrated as it came on shore in, in China. Yeah, and stronger. It, it, and, and it grew very rapidly in intensity in the last 24 hours. And I think it was that growth in intensity that really caught people off guard. You know, they see it going out here and the degrading. And I'm not sure in this part of the world if maybe they were more accustomed to storms like Sandy, which degraded as it came on shore. Uh, in this case, it grew very much in intensity. And that, that led to the impacts. Um, he, oh, I'll have to dig around. There, uh, there were lots of news clips about things. Um, I didn't see anything about them evacuating people. And it, 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 as I looked at this, it really got me thinking about whether, how much in China they ever use that. You know, there's so much population there that maybe their approach is always shelter in place. It'll be, it's an interesting item for discussion. Now that the model is operating, that becomes your next question of what do you do with the information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and that's that's the interesting case of uh, of Bangladesh too, where they have to move the people. There's just no choice, and they have to move a lot of people, and they need many days of advance notice because they're they're moving on foot. So, yeah, each each situation presents its own its own unique solution, perhaps, because, you know, for example, if there is high ground, well, that makes it a lot easier. You can move there for a relatively short amount of time, perhaps. Um, in the story on the right, they, the uh, meteorologist is, is talking about the, the, this being a very fast-moving storm. And they, they did mention that the storm made a surprise landing, which I thought was an interesting choice of terms. And I think what that was referring to is the speed of the approach and also the intensity, that it was much more intense than what they thought it looked like 24 hours earlier. So that just points the challenges of this, you know, that it's, these things are moving and they're changing, and those changes can have really big impacts on, on flooding. So uh, just a, a brief talk about next steps. Uh, the other hazards we'd mentioned, one is, uh, a wave. You saw the wave model run. And we've also been working on a wind model. And this has an animation as well. Uh, this is a, a model called WARF. And this is showing the, the velocity of the winds at about uh, 10 meters above ground, which is the normal measure used to look at that. 
And this is information that you could also use to guide your decision making. So maybe at the university, you might take that into account, uh, or even for your shipping as well. So we have, this is not operational yet. It's in, it's in development, and we're not sure exactly where this is going to go. But it would be an obvious next step to add wind information as, as your next hazard. <clears throat> the other part, of course, is, oh, yeah. Oh, probably should get the microphone. Sure. You considered looking at uh, inland flooding as another potential hazard. Mm -hmm. Here in the U.S., that's actually where most of the damage and loss of life is from inland flooding after. Yes, absolutely. And the, one of the interesting things with inland flooding with these type of storms is that it's in Washington, D.C., it's a perfect example where <clears throat> when you've got a a Hurricane Isabel or Hurricane Sandy, it's often associated with a lot of rain. Hurricane Sandy actually dumped, I think it was like 12 inches of rain just over on the eastern shore somewhere. There's a little town called Belle Isle or something. And if that rain had happened to be you know, if you, in the Potomac River watershed, and you combine that with a storm surge, well, guess where those two things meet? They meet right there at the tidal basin. And you get, you get very high water levels. Um, it is very common with hurricanes that it's a combination of, of freshwater flooding and storm surge combined that's causing the problem. Um, that would be also another step, would be to do the uh, flood inundation mapping. Uh, that's an example where you would really need the better digital elevation model. The, the shuttle radar with the 30 meter, you could do it as a kind of prototype, you know, proof of concept. But it's not going to get you down to that accuracy you need to do an urban scale flood modeling. Um, the other, if you're building a complete hazard warning system, we've talked about mainly about the hazards and mainly about storm surge. We, we touched on a little bit this, this concept of, of dis developing the message, of, of how do you get the message. You, you craft the message in such a way that people not only understand it, but they do the, do the right thing. And then you have to figure out how to get that information out to people. So we're working right now on a, a, a prototype web application that would support both the risk assessment work, but also could start w helping out on the communication end as well. And I think that's the, that's the conclusion of the, the slides right there. So if there's any other questions, I'm available. And that, <laughs> that's a way. That's actually farther up north, almost near, uh, near Shanghai, that wave there. Yeah, they have their shutters down. <laughs> well, thank you. This was great. And again, I think I said it last time, it's edifying to me. And there's years to talks that look at how people were thinking about problems to products and tools that are dealing with problems and hopefully that in this coming storm season. China will be a tool of decision making. And if it works, propagate it out. All these storms are raking across the globe. They get the Chinese coast and the audience there. Yeah. This is great. Um, any questions, both online, if you're online, uh, please type in your question. Billy will. Questions here in the room. We've been taking them all along. But... Oh, and if you would identify yourself and your affiliation. Sure. I'm Ari Gerstman. I'm with UCOR. Mm -hmm. uh, on your on your model with the 300 or so nodes, mm -hmm. uh, how often is the information on those nodes refreshed uh, so that when the track is then laid on top of it? You have new data that you're that you're working with, so that obviously conditions uh, across those nodes change as tides change, as uh, other weather events elsewhere change, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then at the boundary of those nodes, are you feeding in information from a global model as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these storm surge models actually run in a, a very 
uh, high frequency. I think it's. Oh, I hate to say. It. I think it's actually ten seconds. It's really fast. It, it, the calculations are insanely fast. Um, the grid itself is static. That's where you build in all of that that bathymetry and that that's that's the the shape of the ocean. Um, the um, but as it, as it's making those calculations, the tides and um, the the storm data is hourly data. So what happens is, although the forecasts are for six hours, the first thing it does is it turns it into hourly data, and then it's fed in. The wave models are very different the way they operate. Uh, they're actually very inefficient. So we've been, as we're trying to tune the wave model to get it to something that would be faster and lighter to run, again, our, our, our goal here is to have this thing run on a $2,000 workstation, not a $20,000, not a $100,000, or to run in the cloud really fast. So right now, the, the cost to run this uh, simulation is about 20 cents in the cloud. Um, and that sounds cheap until you have to run 100,000 of them for a, a catastrophe model. And then if you add a wave model on top of that, which could triple that, for example, or even order by an order of magnitude, it really starts getting expensive to run these things. So we've been uh, tuning the wave model. Uh, and I think the last one, I think that one we're refreshing just once an hour. So here you've got the storm surge model. I think it's like 10 seconds. And the wave model, one hour, and to try and balance those things out and yet still get good results. That's they're now getting into that area I know very little about because I am not the modeler. Just to make that clear, I'm the project manager here, and I call myself data wrangler because that's what I do a lot of is going around chasing around and finding the data. But it, as I said, it takes a, an, somebody incredible expertise to to build these models and make them run. Um, yes, so my name is Dan Sabo. I am uh, uh, an associate here on Mining on the Environment and Natural Resources Practice. Um, I just wanted to know to what extent the model does or could expand to incorporate um, like really like a micro analysis on a city, like city street to city street, the low points, the vulnerable points versus the high points and translating that into um, actionable advice um, um, acted upon. Exact, um, I mean, the, the, large, the large map, um, you would, I guess that's just one way that you could look at it, mm -hmm. shipping or electrical grid supply. Um, but then just, again, city street to city street, it can vary so much and it can mean so much it may be like in death for one neighborhood versus another. So can the model get into the, that level of detail um, and actually start to incorporate risk as well? Or is that something you see the model evolving? Um, yes. Now, that, that part of it would really be getting more into the area of inundation modeling, uh, which is a, a, a hydraulic modeling. There's, there's two. Two ways you can do that on the cheap. And the, the way it's typically done is with what they call bathtub elevations. So you take your water level and you just project it in a level line onto the, onto the landscape. And it actually can get you pretty close. And the reason people do that is because the hydraulic modeling is very labor intensive and expensive. Uh, and actually, for example, in Washington, DC, there still is no, in this city, there is still no 2D model it's capable of modeling, inundation modeling for storm surge and a riverine flood at the same time. The Army Corps of Engineers right now is finishing up a 1D model, uh, and they're pretty far along on that. That will only handle riverine flooding. It will not handle riverine plus a storm coming in from the Chesapeake. So here we are, the nation's capital, and we don't even have that. It's, to me, just amazing. So that's, it's, it's a tall order for a city to put something like that together. So what we've been looking at, um, it, the, the data that you run into is you really want the high resolution topography. You really need to be able to tell the difference. If you're going to be showing that level projecting onto the, 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 the streets and the different neighborhoods, you need something better than the 30 meter shuttle radar. So we were looking at, for China, a, a product that the Germans uh, uh, 
aerospace group put out, which is called Tandem X. It's a 12 meter bare earth uh, DEM. And I was doing a comparison in a city in China, and it was quite a bit better. It was enough better that you could make out roads. You could definitely see the definition of, of smaller streams. And I think with that, you could do something OK. To really do uh, a, a urban scale flooding and do a good inundation mapping, probably the minimum you'd need is a good bare earth 10 meter or better. I mean, really, one meter is that's more what's being done now. Um, and that, at that point, you get really great definition. So that's the challenge. You have a data challenge there. And then the cost of building those models it can be labor intensive. But there, I think there's ways around that. that the challenge there would be the, the, if we could come up with the, the LIDAR data. LIDAR, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a, a, an approach for developing uh, uh, topography maps that's very, very accurate, very high resolution. So my name is Dan Evans. I'm the Bureau of Environmental Officer at USAID's Global Development Lab. Thanks for this great talk. Um, I was just a quick question about the tidal data. In the, one of your early slides, you noted that it's collected from tidal gauges. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if there's a country that doesn't have tidal gauge infrastructure, can you also collect that remotely, satellite? No, unfortunately. Um, you know, we've looked at that, and <clears throat> there's there's nothing that that can replace the actually not nothing. The best alternative would be, as I mentioned, social media, where you're looking at photographs and and trying to determine high water marks from that. And and that's actually, I mean, that's that's done a lot of places. As I said, you know, even after the big storms in the U.S., um, that's often done. There's teams that go out and try and determine those high water marks. Well, one thing I will mention, um, I think it's NOAA is now doing a thing where they're putting these kind of disposable, dropping these disposable water level gauges along beaches. And I'm actually not even quite sure how they work, but I think they, they might float or something. And they're designed to be pretty indestructible, so maybe at least half of them survive. And so there's, there's people who are working on this problem trying to figure out how to get around it. It's, it's really an important one. Um, just a quick question to go back to um, your statement about you know the trade-off between uh, cost and accuracy mm -hmm. for being able to do this on a desktop versus mm -hmm. a supercomputer. Have you all, do you have any sense um, of what that trade-off translates to? I mean, in terms of accuracy, and I, I'm all for you know providing a tool that you can actually afford to use and know how to use versus something that are sort of possible in terms of costs and other things. But I just wondered if you have some order of magnitude um, calculation as to what, what that trade-off is. Uh, the trade-off actually is in the size of the grid. <clears throat> so. The accuracy for the storms we've tested it against has been very, very good. It all those locations, and actually maybe I'll go back up to the <clears throat> picture of the grid there. Um, well, even in in here, uh, let me get to actually to the one where we show the grid. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's this area here that has the very highest resolution, the 300 meter, and that's where you get by far the best results. But even in this area, where it's somewhat lower, it's probably going down to about a kilometer long here, we have very good results versus the water level gauges. Once you get out to the edge of the grid, it becomes a little more doubtful. And definitely, it actually will return values from outside the grid. And those values are definitely would not be used. And we specifically say in the user manual, do not use values that are out in these outer reaches or outside the grid. And that also applies to areas inshore. You know, the, the grid reaches so far in, but you can't use it farther in than that. It's, it wouldn't be reliable. So the trade-off is that this grid is very small. Normally, when you build these grids, you'd build a, one giant grid for all of China. And you'd run the thing all at once. 
And so the, the problem here is if you, for example, want a storm search model for Vietnam, to keep it in this framework, you probably need three or four more grids just to cover Vietnam. So it's, a, it's actually it's a labor cost to develop the grid, a one-time cost, that then gets you this small, very efficient model. So it's a little bit like, I guess you think of it as like you're moving stuff around in a small vehicle instead of a great big SUV. Um, and, and so, it, but to get that fast runtime. So within the area that, that is covered by the way that your model is set up, it's highly accurate. Yes, yeah. So in these areas here that are very dark green, it's it's been very accurate in all the, the validation we've done so far. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Peter. That was great. Okay, great. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And stick around. Great. Uh, in July, we will be here with uh, Karen Fox of the Tango with the Atlas Project at Education um, and Agriculture. Nothing in August. And in September, we're going to be here at Colonics for possibly the Wilson Center. And it'll be in the US Global Change Research Program talking about um, the next National Climate Assessment of the United States. All at. Um, so we'll see you in a month. Thanks. Hold on, I got one more thing. I forgot I have prizes for our volunteers. Yeah. Now, I've been told this is sea salt dark chocolate. This is the favorite of storm surge modelers all around the world. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> With real sea salt. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> so thank you all for that was that was really great for me.